to the October 21st McMinnville City Council work session. And I will call us to order. Claudia, do you want to do a roll call? Yes. Councilor Drabkin? Here. Councilor Garvin? Here. Councilor Geary? Here and loving this meeting so far. <laughs> Councilor Stassens? Here. I didn't see Councilor Peralta. Councilor Peralta? Um, Council President Minky? Here. And Mayor Hill? Here. Well, again, um, we'd like to welcome everyone to our work session this evening. And this is a presentation and a discussion that has taken lots of effort, a lot of work over a long period of time, but the classification and compensation analysis consultants recommendation. And I would submit that we have some of the consultants on the line with us, uh, Kylie, but I'm gonna turn it over to you to present and start the discussion tonight. Okay, well, thanks so much for, for being here tonight. Um, tonight we have our consultants from Gallagher Benefit Services with us. They've worked on this project now um, for many, many months. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to them so they can kind of just roll right into the project and what they wanna share with you all this evening. I do wanna refer you to the staff report in your packet this evening. Um, we're providing recommendations from the consultants tonight but not asking the city council to make a motion or to approve anything um, is we will need to go through those recommendations as city staff, review them with the lens of our core services conversations, with our budget, with any budget uncertainty we might be having due to COVID, um, all of that. And then we'll be making um, really a final recommendation to the council um, either separately or that might just come through the budget process and Jeff and I'll work together on how we want to handle that. Mm -hmm. um, but, so this is informational so we can learn um, what they've been doing and what they've been up to. They'll talk a little bit about the methodology that they've used in this project, about what the system is, um, kind of an overview of class and comp, and then um, down to some of the financials during um, the recommendations and then they'll be able to also answer questions and I'm going to be on the call too, so I can answer any questions that you may have. With that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Hey, can everybody hear me? Perfect. Sorry about that. I uh, had some technical issues where the speaker all of a sudden went to the Bluetooth upstairs, so they were, the family was enjoying the music at the beginning right there. <laughs> My wife's like, I think I can hear everything here. So. Um, Deeksha can't share her screen yet, so I'm trying to navigate, make sure I have the most recent version of the PowerPoint, so I apologize for the, uh, the technical issue there. Um, hold on a second. So I'm trying to get it on my Gmail here, because we have a system that I have to log into, and it makes it way, way slow, so I apologize. For that, I was to log into it outside of that system. But um, as I as I wait for that, I just want to introduce ourselves and say it's been a pleasure working with with Kylie and the team and the city on this and, and learning the learning the, the area and everything like that. Um, my my background, I've been with Gallagher for about uh, 15 years, been doing class and comp projects exactly like this all of that time for cities, counties, school districts, states across the country, and everything like that. So we. Uh, Mike, we, Mike, we lost your audio. But I can hear what I think is your kids again. that I do not understand what's happening with technology. We there can, I am, I'm back now. We can hear you now. Thank you. I'm trying to get this loaded on here. Deeksha still can't share her screen and she had the presentation, so I apologize for 
Mike, this is Karen. I'm not yeah. sure, but I might be able to share my screen. Do you want me to try? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. For some reason, it's not popping up on Deeksha. I don't know if it's because she's in Citrix or whatever that is. Okay. There we go. Yeah, no, we have it. It's showing. <laughs> All right. We can make that a little bit bigger and put it in presentation mode there. Make sure it's sharing the right screen because I know, Karen, you got two screens. Yeah, I'm trying, well. to, uh, trying to figure out how to get that working right. Um, let's see. What do you see right now on my screen? Blue. The Windows oh. emblem. Okay. Let me try and turn off one of my screens, see if that makes Okay. There it is. We're, we're back Perfect. To able to find okay. It. All right. So. And I'm All right. Trying. So. We're going to walk through this relatively uh, uh, quickly from our perspective. But if you have any questions, please stop us. We'd rather have this be a conversation and not save questions to the end or anything like that. So I think we can use the chat feature or anything like that. We'll be monitoring that. And if Kylie, if you see anything there, just please stop us and let us know. I introduce myself. The other two folks on the um, call is Deeksha and Karen. Uh, Deeksha, do you want to introduce yourself and then Karen? Uh oh. Um, uh, I, I there we go. All right, perfect. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Deeksha Garg. I've been working with Kylie and Mike on the project for City of McMinnville. Uh, I've been a consultant with Gallagher now for the last six years and I work on uh, other city and county and other public sector projects uh, for classification and compensation. Hi, my name is Karen Welch and I also work with Gallagher and support Mike and Deeksha on various projects. Um, so Supporting them on the back end, some of the an analyt analytics, if you will, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you for your time tonight. All right, so let's uh, flip ahead to the next slide here, quick, since I can't get this. So we're going to walk through just what the project was, walk through each of these phases of the project, so you understand what went into it, and then ultimately we want to spend most time on the market comparisons, the results, the salary structure development, and what those implementation costs are. Those are where the big questions are, but we also want to make sure you're educated just on the amount of work that kind of goes into that process. It's not just the dollars at the end or anything like that. There's a lot of internal thoughts, internal equity, all those con uh, concepts that go into this. So let's flip through to the, the next slide. All right, so project administration, we we're hired to do a class and comp study. Again, this is what we uh, work at. We're going to look, look at just setting up the project, make sure we understand all the ins and outs as much as possible at the beginning of the project. What are the pain points? What are the issues that are present? And then the first step is to understand the work that's there and then understand internal equity and everything. So these are the main objectives. Review the current classifications, develop and revise classification structure. That means starting with understanding the work that's there. That's why we spend a heavy time looking at the descriptions, questionnaires, all those types of aspects. The next piece is to make sure we're collecting market data and salary information on appropriate comparable um, organizations, but then also on comparable jobs. That really means job content, not just title to title. And we'll get into that a little bit. And then take that information, develop a new pay structure, look at internal equity and market results. And the key concept here is that developing internal equity is ensuring that we have a system and a framework that has compliance for the new Oregon Pay Equity Act and everything that exists. And that's, that's what we, we kind of pride ourselves on doing that over the last 30 years, having extensive experience in that area and then develop the cost options for moving into that structure. And so there's various different approaches, everything we'll walk through that as well here. Go ahead, Karen. It's My screen is frozen. There we go, got to go <laughs> again. <laughs> All right, Class yes, classification part. This is uh, developing the position description questionnaires. We want to get raw data information from the employees, understanding what the essential responsibilities are, decision-making examples. We received approximately 115 of those. Supervisors had an opportunity to review and comment, not change original content at all, but basically just to review and add um, explanation to various of these. 
We had 10 occupational panels representing approximately 56% of the employee job titles. Now we don't need to talk to every single employee. We don't need to talk to all the job titles. Some are more understandable based upon the questionnaires, the documentation that exists. But a lot of them, we just wanna make sure we have a chance to get the, the nuances of. We deal with a lot of different municipalities. Everybody's structured a little bit differently, but making sure we understand what those, the differences, similarities are between different positions. So from those, we uh, developed a revised classification system. Went from 133 titles down to 70 titles. That does not mean that you're gonna be at 70 titles for the next five years. That is gonna continuously change. And we actually just had an example of a discussion that happened, uh, I think it was today or yesterday. Just like it's constantly gonna be reviewed as new jobs are created and some jobs go away. Ensures greater consistency, simplifies that classification structure so that uh, Kylie has the ability to kind of build slot jobs on a more continuous basis. It's more responsive to changing uh, work uh, requirements and everything as well. And it also allows for position specific titles within a broad classification. Instead of creating a whole new job description for that, it's very similar, but it deals in this program or in this system. Those are what sometimes employees want to make sure that it reflects on the outside of what their, do, what their expertise is for the city. So that's what that process was. That was reviewed uh, through management discussions and by HR to revise that and come up with that 70 classifications. That was our basis for developing internal equity and then also for uh, getting the market data uh, from the external market. So onto the job evaluation piece. So this is a methodology looking at internal equity. Now there are numerous different job evaluation methodologies that are out there. The methodology that we're using here is called the decision band method. It's a formal job valuation method that is applied to every single job. It helps with internal equity, identifying that job value hierarchy, similarly situated positions, or substantially similar responsibilities, but it helps with that management evaluation as jobs continuously change. Kylie can take this and apply and say, yes, this job has changed at the level that yes, it does go to the next grade. We're looking at it through a lens that can be applied to all these positions. DBM, uh, we have proven, we have extensive experience. Uh, we're, Deeks and I are in Minnesota, Karen's down in Phoenix, but in Minnesota, we've had a pay equity act in place since uh, 1984. It's uh, required all public sector organizations, cities, counties, school districts to comply with a very rigorous multi-linear regression analysis between female and male dominated jobs. The approach that we take here is the same approach that we take in the clients there to help them comply with that. And all of our organizations pass this test. They have an underpayment ratio test that organizations have to pass in order to continue to get state funding. For some, it's, it's uh, pretty important that they pass this. But um, the, the issue here is that Oregon doesn't really have a test to comply with yet. So we are going through the lens of something else to ensure compliance that it would pass any type of test that they would put in place. And that's based on our experience working in there, also working with pay equity compliance within uh, in, up in Canada where they have very strict laws as well in Quebec and Ontario. So that's, that's the methodology. It is gender and race neutral. We're looking at the job responsibilities, not individual positions or anything like that. It's consistent and for ongoing implementation. The next slide here really does get into what DBM is itself. And I, I can really nerd out on this for a while if you want me to, because I, uh, I enjoy the concept of it, but it's, we'll let you, uh, you can have this later on and read it, but it's the decision band method focuses on work. We're not looking at the quality, the, the skills, the knowledge of the incumbents in it, but what is the work of those levels responsible for? So that's why it is trying to look at it through that lens, it's gender race neutral. Now we still have to analyze it from that perspective because when gender and races dominate different classifications, we have to ensure that we're looking at it in that perspective. But DBM looks at the value of the job, the premises, the value job reflects the importance of the organization. All jobs are important. They just have different impacts to them. The importance or the impact is directly related to decision-making requirements. And the key concept in this, as opposed to point factor methods or anything else to evaluate jobs, is that we're starting from a common spot. All jobs are making decisions and decision-making is measurable within that. So the next slide kind of just goes through, it's a very broad three-step process that we look at where we're trying to funnel jobs from one point down into more minute comparisons. So we wanna first get all the jobs what is the highest level decision making that this job is responsible for? What band does that go into? Now, most of the folks on this call right here are gonna represent band F. 
You are the policy making the council of the city. That's why that exists. Other levels are going to be in band E, band D, and band C. But we do know that every single job is not going to be doing all of their responsibilities at their highest level. So we're not trying to add up points to get to a grade. We're first saying that, hey, in Kylie's position, for example, maybe she has some D, D level responsibilities, some C and some B. It's like, you know what? The highest level responsibility that she has is in D. That is the bucket that that position should go in first. And we're talking about Kylie, but it's a job to, as the HR person. That is the role. That should, is where the bucket, that job should fall. Then we start comparing all those jobs that are in that smaller bucket into the appropriate grade within that bucket. Then once you do look at the two different grades in that bucket, then look at the comparisons on those job difficulties, those nuanced levels of the positions. But the ability to have more minute and finite comparisons on a smaller group of jobs helps with the overall inter and intra rater reliability. So if we came back at this five years from now and rated the jobs, we're gonna be very consistent with where we are now in the same way that if we had 10 of us all trained on this methodology and applied it, we're gonna come out very consistent as well. So that's one other thing that's been proven. And I can talk about this for a while. Deeksha and Karen have heard that for a while and they get bored of it as well. So, but if you have any questions about this, please let us know at all or anything. So uh, we can move on unless Kylie, you're seeing any questions from folks at all. All right. So now we get to um, probably the main reason why we're, what we're all here is the compensation side. And this is kind of the fun stuff where the stats nerds and us get to, to get into this a little bit. Um, so we, we looked at um, published salary surveys to collect market data for both private and public sector industries. Now that's key and we really applaud the city for going this way because there are a lot of positions that are multi, that are across industry. So we looked at Willis Towers Watson comp data um, Mercer, or sorry, I didn't see that in our when we were reviewing this last week that we had duplicated that one. Economic Research Institute, as well as the League of Oregon Cities. So we collected market data from all of those, looking at job responsibilities, job descriptions that are going to exist as well. So they have to meet some standards. They're conducted by a reputable survey firm. They're not done in house to an association. Survey is not self reported. It has to go through that third party to be reviewed and cleaned and make sure it's done right. It's conducted on a continual basis, not just a one shot survey, so that they can validate data year over year. And they, have, they report as data sources, effective date, and they have a methodology for ensuring accurate matches. So that's why we sometimes we hear about surveys from clients. We can't use all of them because we want to make sure that it comes from a valid source. So this is the, the market data listing on the next slide. We'll get into a little bit more of it is identifying benchmark jobs. Where, what jobs are we going to get market data on? So we identified 37 benchmark classifications that we were fairly confident we're going to get market data on. These represent 75% of the employees. So they're selected based upon representative of all the levels. We want to make sure we have A band, B band, C band, et cetera. It represents all the functional areas. It's a high incumbent count. They're common in the labor market, but also some of those jobs that might be more difficult or uh, difficult to recruit or where high turnover exists. If that's something that y'all need to know about, we want to make sure we can see if we can find some information. But it's representative of the, the, the various hierarchical levels, but then also with regards to the functional areas. So that's how we end up with the 37, and those will be at the end. We can look at those as well. Keep going, Karen. Oh, we did put them here. Thank you. So these are the 37 positions that we had. You can, you can leave it up there for a while or we can keep moving. All right. Let me know. You want to see them more? <laughs> Usually that's where people want to stop. And they're like, hey, that's me or that's, that's so-and-so or something like that. So, all right. Um, when we're collecting it, we want to make sure we're following the Sherman Antitrust Guidelines, all that type of stuff. But the key criteria is that we're making sure we're matching jobs that match content. They're 80% they're of responsibilities. Oh, yes. Mike, sorry, Council President Minky had a question. So, Kelly? I, I just wondered, I, I think you said it, but I wanted to be sure we are going to get a copy of all mm -hmm. this. Because I haven't seen any yes. of this beforehand. Yes, we're going to share the PowerPoint with everybody. We waited until tonight just because um, they were still making some tweaks to the slides. Okay, just want to be sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. 
All right, so we're matching job content, that's what's key. There's a couple of different adjustments that we're gonna make to this data, okay? Oh, sorry, Karen. Sometimes those systems are a little slow. So basically two different adjustments that we're gonna make to this market data. We want to first ensure that it's all adjusted for the McMinnville labor market. Now that's gonna be different. Some of those, those surveys are gonna have different data cuts that exist. We're gonna look for the, the closest labor market that we can get, whether that's uh, the state of Oregon or whether that's the Pacific Northwest or something like that, but we wanna make sure it adjusts to that labor market. We use the Economic Research Institute, Geographic Assessor, that's the gold standard, that's the common practice where they're looking at a various different statistics. We're looking at the cost of labor. So as you can see here, McMinnville is 9.7% above the national average. So therefore, if we had any data cuts that had to be from the national data cut from there, we would adjust it up by 9.7% to make it effective for the labor market that, that you all are in. But when we're collecting the data, we're trying to go from these kind of focused on your area, bigger and a little bit bigger than that as well. So we're trying to get as close to, we, to McMinnville as possible. The other piece that we have to adjust this market, mar the market data by is the effective date of the survey. Not all of those survey sources that we showed you earlier were published on the same date. And so we're aging um, all this to the most common effective date of March 15th, 2020. But we're utilizing World at Work, which is the Compensation Professional Association. They do a salary planning survey every single year. And they say, what are people planning to do for salary adjustments on a um, um, merit increase, on a COLA pay adjustment? This is the uh, what comes out this last year as well. And at that time was 3% was the actual uh, pay adjustment. That was the median, especially in within the Pacific Northwest and even within the public sector, 2% for pay range data, minimum, midpoint, maximum. So we utilize those annual percentages. Of course, so if the survey well, was a... Yeah. yeah uh, you know, we have we have the county within McMinnville. What effects does that have on the data, you know, having a entity that's larger than the city and they having an impact on the marketplace? Um... And in one individual organization, when it comes to the overall trends, is not going to have a huge significant impact. Now, when it comes to recruiting for individual positions, yes, it's going to have a higher level impact because of if those positions are shared between those two different entities and the locality that you're in. But for those individual adjustments, now, should you compare these the, the adjustment percentages to what your immediate peers are doing? Yes, I would highly recommend that you do that but we wanna ensure that we're adjusting this broad data set by a trend number as well that represents that entire broad data set and not just by one organization. Right. And Kylie, did you have anything to add? Oh, sorry. Well, and then also how critical it is to make that we're comparing the same job description in functionality as compared just in title, because the county could have mm -hmm. a position that is not, it's got the same title, but doesn't have the same responsibility. And I mean, this is done in the private sector all the time. I come from a banking <laughs> and, you know, every bank is different. And, you know, the banking industry has been, found to uh, have some real uh, liabilities out there just because of how they call a specific position, but it's really the duties and the responsibilities and the breadth of control or lack of control that is there. Yeah, I, I completely agree. My brother's in the banking area and that's and have, we have the same conversation. Um, Mayor, I think you might be maybe getting at um, some of our sworn positions um, within public safety uh, for our police and fire departments. We purposefully left our sworn um, public safety employees out of this project um, because we do go through the collective bargaining process with them. So we're looking at comparable jurisdictions and using that to come up with um, an appropriate offer through that process. So those um, sworn police officers and sworn firefighters were not included in this study. Thank you for that clarification, uh, no. Kaylee. It's, that's really important for us to know as we're gathering this information the first time into our minds. Yep. All right, Karen, let's move on. 
So we talked about the two different adjustments and everything. These are, once we make all those, we're making the comparisons to the pay of those similar positions at the city. These are the metrics that are used in kind of establishing the competitiveness levels the city has. Anything that's plus or minus 5%, we consider that highly competitive. Allows for the margin of error in the data. It also allows for knowing that, hey, maybe the market has made adjustments up and the city hasn't. The city has made adjustments up and the market hasn't. But that's highly competitive. Plus or minus 10% is competitive. Then you get into over 10% potentially misaligned or misaligned. Now, even if positions are misaligned at more than plus or minus 15% off the market, that does not mean in reality that it needs, you, you need to address it in any way. It could be that the person that you have five people in that job and you just recently hired them in the last two years, they might be more than 15% off what that market rate is because of the tenure that they have in that job. The data itself is gonna give you an indicator, but it's not gonna be the complete story either. So we, we have those in there to kind of put a framework to it. We're not here to say this job is off. You need to adjust all the people in that job. We're here to say, let's use this data in a comprehensive fashion to develop a salary structure so the city has competitive minim minimums, midpoints, and maximums. So, all right, Karen. So overall, we looked at the comparison of the city at three different levels in the market, the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, and the 75th percentile. Now, over 80% of organizations, public or private, are gonna be trying to compare their, or their salaries at the 50th percentile of the market, that middle point. Most private sector organizations, when I worked in the private sector as well, that's where they try to balance their salaries. So as you see here, we have against the public sector as well as against the full market of both public and private. Public sector, y'all are about 2.8% higher than that 50th percentile for actual pay. On the full market side, 1.1%. So overall, your actual pay is highly competitive. You've done a good job of maintaining pace with the market for actual pay. All right. So I saw some applause earlier. I feel like there should be some applause or something like that. <laughs> so I thought I saw some of those at least one time. But so factors like performance, turnover, longevity, all of those things are going to impact individual job comparisons. That's just the, the reality of, of, what, of what we have there. So any, any questions on, on this chart? I really want you to focus on the, the middle point. We use the 25th and the 75th percentile as guidelines for us, especially when we're setting up the salary structure itself. So, well, as, uh, Mike, as you indicate, that's a good that's a good place to be because we we don't have to uh, ramp up salaries so so much and have such a, a financial impact. There could be financial mm -hmm. impact as we see in the memo, but I've seen organizations that are so out of bounds mm -hmm. that. You know, it takes them five years to get them into a position, and that's a yep. position to be in. Yep, yep. I I completely agree. We've worked with have the most clients where they're like, we need to develop a five year plan to implement this because it can't be done. So, all right, Karen, let's move on. All right. So here is where what we're trying to really fix and what we're trying to address with a lot of these is that we are looking at both the minimum and the maximum of the pay range. And so you can see that if we compare the pay ranges that exist right now at the city, that the minimum might be competitive or highly competitive with the market, but it's the issue that the maximum itself is misaligned with the market. At the public sector side, approximately 16% below Pro, uh, the full market about 20% below. The current range spread that the city has is 26%. The market was over 60%. So what that tells us is that there might be kind of a fundamental difference in how the pay range that the city had been set in the past. Traditional public sector organizations are gonna set their salary range and say, here's the minimum, here's the maximum, the maximum is set at the target pay rate and everybody gets there and that target pay rate is the 50th percentile. So what the city is missing out on is the ability to bring people from the minimum to that target rate to be able to pay above that when needed as well. So that's, that's that gap that exists right here. And so now you can continue to do the same thing because your actual pay is highly competitive. 
But if we're looking at that salary structure and ensuring you have the capability to pay, whether that's uh, market premium positions or high performers or anything like that, however you desire to be able to move people through a pay range, the salary structure needs to be expanded in some way. Any questions on this slide before we get into the heavy math? All right. So the next step that we do is we start combining the market data that we collected with the internal equity evaluation. Now that's where the key comes in into having that, that compliance with any type of pay equity act that exists so that you can, you're letting the internal equity impact the market data that's collected. Because as we all should know that there is historic uh, pay inequities that exist between different occupations and, and industries, all of that coming into it. If you're looking at it through a, a job evaluation method, you're able to help mitigate some of those pay differences. And then for those jobs that you don't have market data for, you're able to slot that job into that right grade and have an assigned market range for it that is based upon a comprehensive calculation that is more than just saying, I think this job is more equivalent to this job than that job, let's put it in that pay range. You have it through a methodology. So we're gonna combine these through some trend lines using regression analysis, trying to plot those points out and find this line of best fit. Now we're using that 50th percentile as the basis for that salary structure as well. So you'll see this kind of, Deke should put this uh, graph, these graphs together and we'll kind of try to grow this, grow this into a more complex picture as well. So we can go on. So what you're looking at here is on the Y axis, we have the dollar value of jobs. On the X axis, these are the internal value of jobs, the decision band rating. So you'll see that we have the A and the B and the C and et cetera. There are point values built behind the scenes in order to spread out those values in an appropriate way based upon the hierarchy of an organization. So you'll see that those salaries are spread out as they should be. You're gonna have people that are lower in the job because they're new, you're gonna have people that are higher in that same job because they've been there for a while. But these are where those benchmark jobs are. That's the dollar values. The next slide, is we overlay the market data. This is the full market, public and private, the 50th percentile of those. You'll see, you kind of see a trend line that exists, fairly similar. So the next piece is you find that line of best fit. Oop, did we go one too far? Nope, we didn't. All right, perfect. Sorry, I thought we had. So what we're looking at here is that line of best fit. You can see that orange line and you can see the blue line. They're very kind of right over top of each other because again, you guys are 1.1% over that market overall. But if you look at that trend, you can see that it starts at the low level, it goes to the high level. People that have been in the management jobs are really close to your current maximum, all that type of stuff. It's probably because they've been at the city for the longest time as well. But My one of the indicators that, oh yes, go ahead. Um, so let's sit uh, again, and if we're going to address it later, let me know. But when we're looking at those boxes on the right that talked about city structure, minimum, midpoint, and maximum, at some point, I'd like you to define what that means. Because for many years, I thought that was kind of like the uh, private sector that was based on uh, years in the job and performance. and. Mm -hmm. I get a sense as I've been at the city, it's a step of one, two, three, four, five years being at max after five years. It's that slow uh, internal um, way to raise your, your, your salary, irregardless to performance, but just time in the seat and it's over a five year period. So I don't know if that's still the case. And I think the counselors need to know the differential mm -hmm. between minimum midpoint and maximum. Yes, that, that, that is the case. We're looking at the entry level pay to what is the maximum highest level pay within all of those jobs. And so right now that is a five or six, I think it's a five step, correct, Kylie? So, yeah, so that's five or six, yeah. Yeah, and it might be different for different occupations or anything like that. So, and, and that is, and, and, and Mr. Mayor, that, that is a traditional public sector approach that exists and now when working across the country and some other places, they may also have a five step 
I worked in one in uh, northern Minnesota. It was a five-step um, structure as well, but they went over that five-step over a 20-year period. It was spread out further, so it was like a, an 8% jump every five years. But I think it's but that's, really, that's how they managed it. And I think it's really important for the council to know that that is it's inherent in in public sector. And we we have a five year ramp up and uh, it's mm -hmm. a part of where they start and they know where they're going to be in five years. And then we just go to uh, COLA kind of uh, increases yep. after that point. Correct. Yep. I believe we're going to talk about this when we get to some later slides, but one of the recommendations from Gallagher is to adjust our pay scale. So it's not just the flat five or six or however many steps, but that we have steps that get you to the midpoint. And then once you're there, that's considered that competitive rate of pay. And then it would increase to the maximum at a slower rate. So that might happen every other year um, until you hit that top. So the goal of these recommendations is that our employees don't hit the cap immediately and that they have time to continue their earning potential. And, and I think that's yep. phenomenal, Kylie, from a standpoint of, you know, just time in the seat shouldn't be the major, the major reward, but it should be, you know, to get you up once you mm -hmm. understand the job, get you up to a certain point, maybe that's midpoint. And then it's, it comes to uh, performance a bit and longer time in the seat. And, and then that becomes a retention tool also. Mm -hmm. Yep. Definitely. Yep, exactly. And we, we try to design our structure so that the, 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 the range can be utilized in any type of approach that our, our clients need to use for, for, for their employee population. Some of them have used to say, we're gonna do steps from the minimum to the midpoint, and then we're still gonna have steps but they're gonna move one step every two years or every three years after that competitive rate as well. So it all, you know, then maybe we're gonna still have steps, but they can only move a step if they uh, are above, uh, uh, have a higher level performance metric or anything like that as well. So there's different methodologies. Well, and I, I hate to, you know, break in as much as I am right now, but it's an area that I've had a lot of, of uh, of experience in, and again, you know, I don't like the methodology that if they're not a high, if they're not a performer, we're going to let them go because that, in many cases, mm -hmm. isn't the case because not all organizations have a review policy, a review process that's effective and and all encompassing, and so you know, mm -hmm. you can almost hide behind uh, others sometimes. Yep. Exactly, and we're, the, the, it depends on all the methodology and the tools and then that the, each of our clients have and how they can manage this going on forward. But what we'll look at next is building that range, the minimum and the dollar values of those. And what we wanna show is that here's how you can move into this new framework. And that's, that, that's the big next step. But before we talk into that, I really wanna get into just the, the validity of this. And this is one indicator that we look at. If we did not have a number at this level, we would have been going back and trying to refine this, looking at different models. But this is kind of that statistical anal analysis. If you look down there, you have the R squared piece. R squared is showing the relationship of the X axis to the Y axis. Anything, if it was an R squared of 1.0, those dots are gonna make the straight line. What we have here is an R squared of 0.926, so it's extremely high. We wouldn't go forward with anything that didn't have an R squared over 0.8, and having someone over 0.9 is extremely high. The validity of the internal and the external balance here is showing that you have a very strong, valid, and defensible salary structure for, for moving forward. So that's that's one thing that we're, we're not making arbitrary decisions here or anything like that. There's, there's, a, there's a good basis for it. So we can move on to the, the next slide here. So just an overlay as a picture, the ranges that we would develop would have a wider range spread to them. We are also looking at a progressive range spread so that jobs in the A band and B band that are more narrowly defined in their the essential responsibilities have a narrower range spread. Jobs that are at a higher level have a broader range spread because of the, the higher impact of education and broader experience that go into the performance of those roles. 
having 10, 15 years as being a custodian at one position is not the same as having 15 years as being a CEO or a CFO or anything like that in other organizations. The, the broader impact exists. It does. And the range spread helps to identify that. Now, we understand sometimes that the optics of something like this does not look ideal, but the reality is those are, those are the, the issues that we need to make sure we have the ability to address. And you can see that that range, that midpoint, gets up closer to where your current maximum is in those middle level positions. And that's where the more higher impact would be. Your minimum is highly competitive. That align is gonna stay about the same. And it's one thing that we do have to consider on the implementation. We don't want the minimum of the range to go down below the current minimum as well. And how does that be impacted by any type of minimum wage movements? Because that is what is rising faster than a lot of those middle level positions in the high B, C band causing some pay compression. So we do have to be cognizant of that over the long term as well. So you're not causing pay compression and causing more issues. Any questions on that? This, this kind of gets to that whole idea that the new target point of the city's pay structure is that middle point that aligns with actual pay and your old, your previous current salary structure had target pay at the maximum. So, so the next slide here shows what the dollars would look like for all of those positions. So what you can see is that we do have a progressive range spread. 30% range spread, that's the difference between the minimum to the maximum. 40% for band B, and then 50% for band C and above. So if you plotted those range midpoints on that line that you, on the previous graph, they would make that middle line, and then we develop ranges outside of that. And then we do have to compare all those minimums to the current minimums, all that, and make sure that we are not going down anyway, which I believe that, that we've done. So, any questions on the the ranges? I know it's, it's a lot of numbers on there, but the 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 ratings on there. That's something the methodology that we have uh, worked with Kaylee a whole bunch about and everything like that to make sure she's familiar with it. But we're always here as a, as a, as a resource and have conversations or anything like that. And we have numerous organizations that we work with on an ongoing basis year over year to help reevaluate those jobs and make sure they're placed in the right spot as jobs get changed and everything to have an, an outside third party look at it. Mike, can I ask just a clarifying question on the previous graph? Mm -hmm. Just to yep. make sure I understand what you're saying there. If you can, yeah, great, thank you. Um, so what you're saying there is that the, the line that represents the 1.1% of the, of the uh, market data, is that the city structure midpoint or the city structure maximum? It was the city structure your, maximum. Yeah, the, the, the proposed structure midpoint represents the 50th percentile of that full market. Gotcha. Which okay. the city is currently 1.1% of on, a, on an aggregate level. Okay. Got it. Yep. And so you're recommending this broader structure to be able to then have that um, flexibility to go higher to the proposed structure maximum, but with the evaluation of, of performance and different things like that, not just a straight... Uh, increase over the years. Is that correct? Correct. That that would be the ideal situation. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. That, for when I say that, I, I, yeah, I, I say that because it's always dependent on whether or not a city they have a a, a good performance management methodology and everything too. So. Yes. Got it. Great. Yep. Thank you so much. Yep. All right. So implementation costs. So the premise of our implementation cost is that we, we never recommend that there's pay cuts. I think there's been two times in my career where we have, and that happened in about 2009 when organizations are trying to like balance the books and all that kind of stuff with regards to this. Employees will be paid within the new pay ranges, meaning no employees are gonna be paid below. And sal salaries may fall above the new pay range maximums. That, that happens. 
we would recommend that sometimes those are being frozen or the compensation phrase is red circled. They would not be adjusted until the range itself would catch up with them. If that is not a potential solution, there are different other solutions to say, how do we still provide some type of increase to those employees above the range? And that's something that we can talk about at, at a different point as well. So the next slide is gonna talk a little bit about the methodologies that we utilized. Um, we have bring to minimum first, basically saying who are all the employees, the 41 employees that are below the, the new minimum, and that would cause a cost $95,000. That's estimating it was on a full-time level and everything, I believe. So 1.3% of overall payroll. The other thing to know is that there are 40 employees that are above the new pay range maximum. Now we have to look at and make sure we know how far they all are above. Many times they're just like $1,000, $500 above the maximum or anything. So the next cycle, they would be within the range. On the highest level, we have bring to the proposed step. We're saying we're gonna utilize the whole range. We're gonna look at how many times, how many years of service have they been in that position, not just with the city either, how long have they been within that position? And so each progression step or kind of the steps within it, whatever increment is equal to one year and moving them from the, from the uh, that's one step from the minimum to the midpoint. And then every two years from the midpoint to the maximum. So you're slowing down that progression from the midpoint to the maximum. This is utilizing the entire range spread. So this would be 688,000 and it impacts 75, 75 people. Now there are numerous algorithms that you can use for how to calculate that, how many steps do we need, all that type of stuff. But this is a starting point. We wanna say, here's how many steps it should take to go from here to here. We use a, 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 a 3% increment for that step increase per year. So that's where we're factoring that on. So that's how we come up with this, developing those steps within there. All right, we can move on to the next slide and then we can kind of get this and talk a little bit of all in a big, uh, better wrap up. So the middle option that we're looking at is the per moving into that structure, but having a cap at the midpoint. Anybody that's already above that midpoint, which is that perceived market rate, we're not gonna, not gonna address anybody in that. So there's one step, one year per step using the years of service in that current position, impacts 50 employees and would be a $380,000 annual cost. So that would move those people closer to that market rate based on how many years they've been in that job. Any questions here? All right, so the next slide just has a summary of all those all put together, but we wanted to make sure you understood kind of the, the background and the, the methodologies behind those. So it's not a small cost. It's, it's also in our experience, it's not a huge, large cost like uh, Mr. Mayor that you had brought up before. It's not something that's, that's unachievable at least. So again, this does not include full-time, I mean, sorry, includes full-time, part-time, does not include the public safety that Kelly brought up earlier. So we do have about 40 employees that are both below the minimum and above the maximum. And those 40 employees are ones that you'd wanna look a little bit, and just look closely at see how far above the maximum. There could be some other past story there that you know somebody had moved into a lower level job and just never adjusted salary. That happens a lot. All right, any questions on this part? All right, so what we, oops, sorry, Karen, you were right. So we did look at a couple of different options here with like phased in approaches, 
approach one is looking at uh, moving everybody in year one, all those that are below the minimum. Year two is move all employees placed in the range using steps of steps, the years of service, however, capping those increases above the current pay from year one at a maximum of 10%. Year three is moving people up to that last step, ensuring that they get to that appropriate placement based upon their years of service. Um, Excuse me, Mike, we might have a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Remy. Um, do you mind going back to the last slide um, for my mm -hmm. structure, my question? Yeah. So when you're talking about um, the uh, 41 employees that are below the proposed minimum and the 40 that are above the proposed minimum, I understand that those employees could be in any of those categories, A, A2, B, C, D, F, mm -hmm. I don't know how far it, I don't know how far it went. <clears throat> Is yep. there, um, have you also done the analysis so we might have an idea uh, of where those um, uh, are that are below the proposed minimum and those that are above the uh, proposed maximum? In other words, it, is it, uh, do we know that or do you know if 20 of the 41 are uh, employees that were in column A, A2, A3, uh, et cetera? Or yeah, D Deeksha, I believe we have, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's a great question because it is important to know like kind of at what level those are at or are they kind of isolated? We've had experience too where they're isolated in like one job function <laughs> because of, past practice with regards to pay and everything like that. Deeksha, I, I know we, we have that, and I believe, uh, Kayla, you probably have in some of the spreadsheets so we can create something, a summary that would help to, to show that and answer that question. I don't know those numbers off the top of my head, I'm sorry. I have it. Hang on just a second. My computer's yep. changed a little bit. Oh. So, um, Perfect. So I, I pulled it up here on my screen. Um, I'm not gonna share it because it has employee um, data on it with employees' names and whatnot. But um, predominantly the positions that are above the maximum are in those lower A and B bands positions, which is a lot of our, our entry level positions mm -hmm. um, or less technical or professional positions. So the vast majority that are above the range are, are in that category. And let me pull up for the ones that are below and see if there's some themes there. The ones that are below the minimum um, are, it's a handful that are in our C-band positions. Um, a good amount are in the C-band positions. Where did um, that C-band start salary-wise? What so would it the, numerically? It's like around... Um, like 60,000 a year up to like 90 to 100. Okay. We have a few, a few that are below that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and so Kylie and partial, or uh, Remy and partial answer that question. The other thing that we're doing is we're going position by position uh, making sure that people are properly slotted. There are a handful of people that have been either reclassified or promoted since their PDQs were submitted. Uh, and so we're making sure that folks are properly slotted as well uh, before we uh, push the, the full and final schedule out for folks to review. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, there's also some of the, the positions that were a little, that were below the minimum. A lot of those positions were actually in the Parks and Recreation Department, and a lot of those employees are not working right now due to COVID. So we we did our, our kind of layoff in that department predominantly and have brought some folks back, but we're still not at the numbers that we have had in the past. So to clarify, the employees that were laid off were included or were not included in this evaluation? They were, their positions were included. Um, but then as we 
finished out this process, those layoffs happened right around the same time that we were compiling this data. So some of the information, some of the numbers aren't going to be 100% accurate due to turnover, mm -hmm. due to merit increases, um, or promotions that we've had. So we need to still go back in and, and do a little bit of update. Mm -hmm. Okay. And those were, those employees were, you said were primarily in the below proposed minimum or above proposed maximum category? Primarily below the minimum. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So these are, th those are the costs. And then we, yeah, Karen, perfect. We can stay right on this slide right here. So basically what we try to do is just kind of phase out these costs over um, one, two, and three years. Year one in both of them is just moving up to that, getting all the employees that are below the minimum up to the minimum, all right? Um, the So in approach one, we have a year two cap at a 10% increase. Year in approach two, in year two, we're capping at the midpoint and a 10% increase. So just kind of, it's, you know, just trying to look at different ways to say, here's what the phase can be. The key is here in both of these approaches, we have applied a salary structure movement of a 1% from year one to year two to year three to ensure that the salary structure itself does not go, go down. That's why if you added up the cost in the previous one and this cost, they're not gonna be the same because year two, the salary structure does move up a little bit as well. And one thing I did forget to point out on the other one is that those are not cumulative costs. It's not increase to minimum plus increase to midpoint plus increase uh, to the step all the way up to the top. The increase to minimum is in both of those because step one would be the minimum for po folks that are below. We wanna make sure they're at that. Anybody below the minimum is gonna move up and then it's not a cumulative, the highest cost total is that far right column. But this one right here is in including a step increase of the salary structure as well. So. So the, the overall recommendations from based on the work is is adopting that new proposed salary structure, uh, sorry, classification structure, helping with the consistency of the job classes, flexibility, identifying transparent career paths, all those things. Adopt the utilization of a job evaluation method that helps with maintaining pay equity and internal equity. Implement a proposed, the proposed salary structure. Now there are different implementation mo models. If that's not what you can afford in year one, year two, and year three, we can always work backwards. <laughs> from what those numbers are and figure out what the right, uh, the, the right algorithm would be. So we also want to put in that it's important to assess these findings and cost implementation due to COVID. We're, we're keeping track of what organizations and how they're responding since March to now based upon the impact of COVID. Many times organizations are moving ahead this year at least with salary structure increases because that's what they communicated to employees or pay increases. A lot of times they were done pre-March or they're done in March or in June, they've gone forward with it. About 50 to 60% of organizations have kind of moved forward with what they had planned for 2020. Other, the rest of the organizations are kind of in a wait and see mentality. They're planning to do it, but they're also be like, um, we're not sure we might do half of that. So we are trying to keep our, our eye and making sure Kelly knows what we're trying to do but what we're hearing with regards to all these impacts, and if there's other questions, we can try to find the data or anything like that. Right now, it's, it's always a moving target because if you all remember back 2008, 2009, people were trying to figure out what to do <laughs> at that point as, as well. So, and then we also have on the next slide here, just kind of things to, to do into the future. Oh, sorry, next steps, imp approve an implementation cost, a cost option determine the time frame for implementing proposed changes, whether that's now or over three years. And then the key is uh, employee communication, how that's rolled out. We have some examples that we can provide how that was communicated, memos, emails, all those types of things that we can say, at least here's some language to start from, so you're not starting from a blank sheet of paper. And then how to um, potentially a, a deal with like people that are feeling like they're not assigned to the right classification as well. So.
think that got it through it. Yeah, you can take my name off there. <laughs> Don't need to see that anymore, but we can go back to the content, see if anybody has any questions on. I'll ask another question if it's all right. Um, yeah. So when, as, as we're moving forward and, and especially as we're communicating with the public here and um, how would you boil down or what, how would you give the, the um, uh, uh, most succinct version of why these increases are being recommended when our pay structure is deemed to be competitive? I think the most succinct way to do it is a recalibration of the internal relationships of the of some of the positions. And then the next tier down would be ensuring the appropriate placement of individuals based upon how many years they have been doing that job to help alleviate pay compression based upon longevity, which is a key aspect. And sometimes it's a one of the more demotivating aspects within an organization that is very hard to quantify. But first it's the internal alignment, then it's the appropriate placement of individuals that are doing that like work based upon how long I have been doing it. Does that answer your question, Remy? I think so. I, we'd like something that was a little bit more user friendly. <laughs> the public's not going to really yeah. catch that one really fast. Let's yeah, let's let's see here. Um, I guess when when I think about it, our salary bands are really narrow, and coming from another agency and and working in HR and doing salary surveys and checking on that. The, the narrowness of our salary bands is actually kind of uncommon. Um, and so while we get people to what would be the midpoint in the recommendations from Gallagher, um, that's, that's our maximum. And employees don't have any additional earning potential beyond that. Where if you go to another outside agency, it's likely much higher. And so right now, we might be paying people competitively, but they could be a 20-year you know, veteran in their position. And if they were working in another organization, they would have a higher earning potential on that. Well, and there's another say piece that of back to you. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know who I interrupted, but. Go ahead, Remy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I was to say that back to you, it's not that we are not paying competitively. It's that there's no room to grow. Yep. And then I think there's another whole area of consideration and that's when you you max out too early in a career then you're more prone to look for our other opportunities and then you have to pay for turnover which is at a very high rate of cost and less effectiveness and so mike i would ask you as a consultant you're probably dealing with that all the time of the cost of turnover and bringing uh, a staff up to a level of 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 a certain expectation compared to what it takes to have a, a broader band and have a mechanism for them to be excited about working to that next level and performing at a higher level now i hope that makes sense but you know yeah no it, it makes perfect perfect sense and you're trying to balance what does that cost of the turnover which is going to vary based upon level of position and how long it takes to fill and then some positions may take only three months to become you know ramp up into it other ones are going to take a year you got to get through a whole year cycle in, in the financial planning process to be fully comfortable doing that work in the next year. And, and then you have the higher max. 
and then you can go one or two years to find out that it's not the right person in the right seat, and then you start all over again. There are so many variables to this, and uh, and I think companies that are on the leading edge of this really understand that 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 mix between having broader band and a process that rewards superior and good uh, performance so that you can keep them around longer. Mm-hmm. Councillor Geary and Councillor Garvin have their hand raised. Zach, let's go with you first and then Adam after Zach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As we move from the presentation to the um, uh, discussion portion, I, I think the I think the consultants, I also want to, in the interest of uh, full disclosure, my lovely wife, Samantha, works for the McMinnville Public Library, so she is a city employee, but I don't feel like that impedes my ability to have this, this discussion. Um, uh, thank you again to the consultants. Um, I, I think I have kind of one specific question and then one sort of uh, thread that I wanted to grab onto. Um, I guess overall, I thought planning was dense, and this is still just trying to work its way through my dense head. Um, so I, I'm kind of going to be more of a listener um, for a change. So uh, my specific question was: You had talked about sworn employees not being included. Is that is that anyone other than a police officer, or is, it, is this is this everyone but the police department, or who who else was excluded? Police officers and firefighters. So both of those positions are sworn. Though those are both represented by a labor union, so they're represented and they're sworn. Mm-hmm. In the study, we included employees who were not sworn, but they may have been represented. So if you think about our police department, it could be our record specialists. Um, it could be people who work in an administrative role. Um, same with at the fire department. So there were employees from either department included in this process, but not police officers and not firefighters. Thank you. Um, and I think what you guys, the thread that I was pulling out or, or, or I'm interested in, and I think you guys were talking a little about it, mm-hmm. is is the sort of phenomenon that I was familiar with that we we quickly, heavily invested in training great qualified people that then went to go work long careers for other departments in other cities. Um, and so h- how to get at that, it was, I'm still trying to rectify how we, we what we competitively pay and yet max out quickly. It's 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 an interesting um, dichotomy. So I'm interested in see what the suggested so- solutions are and where that curve on the graph is. So um, yeah, I think thanks for that and and a lot of info. Um, so th- that's kind of the main thing I'm ch- I'm chewing on at the moment. I don't know if if the consultant has any comments, but the rest of the discussion could maybe answer that. So which you guys are kind of talking about already. Well, and I, I wonder, um, Councillor Geary, if if the the kind of the examples that you're giving with the turnover, I think those might be in the public safety positions. Um, I, I could think of some of that, you know, in, in I mean, I don't have to give it specific examples, but beyond that, I think there were a few in in sort of the the I guess wastewater or, okay. or a few other places where it just felt like people got trained up. Felt like they maxed out and then went and did other things and i know there's a host of other factors that go into that but um mm-hmm. i can think of a few examples of the outside of just those positions so i may follow up with you about those just to make sure i have an understanding of the ones that you're talking about yeah. and there might be other reasons for those so um okay. but i can follow up with you about it mm-hmm. And I don't know, Mike. Maybe if you see that in your experience with other jurisdictions, or if we have a, if we're you, if we are, um, if we have a high percentage of that, maybe maybe that was what the mm-hmm. data was showing as far as quick to max and then sort of, whoop, what do I do now? Um, is mm-hmm. that, that common for a lot of places that haven't had this study? Or yeah, there's yeah, it, it, and especially with the 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 proximity to a, a metro area. It does have a, more, a higher level impact on that. We've worked with a lot of organizations that might be, you know, an hour, hour and a half outside of, of that metro area, and they ha- it has a lower cost of living and everything, and they might pay lower. They're going to go down there, they can get the job, they can be there for five years, get their their cert- certifications or whatever that is. And we see it a lot within like the the public safety for the sworn positions that that Kaylee was talking about as well, where they're going to get that, then they can move into something else and have a higher level. And that's where it comes the balance between. What are we, where are we placing our salary structure in comparison to that? You're not 
the major metro area, but you're close enough, people can drive 40 minutes in one way, they can drive 40 minutes the other way. So yeah. th that, th that's, that's where it comes into play, exactly the example you're talking about. It seems like it is tough to compete with the gravity of some of those places in different ways, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yep. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, thanks for the presentation tonight. Um, kind of circling back around to some of Remy's comments. I was curious, uh, and this is probably more a question for Kylie, on with those wage compressions, are we not seeing uh, still like high tenured employees? I mean, from what I've heard tonight, it kind of seems like that would be our risk of, of not creating a higher ceiling within the organization is that we could lose tenure with employees. But from my understanding, we have a lot of long-term tenured employees. And so it kind of seems like we're spending money. If we do this at full scale, we're spending money to get, to look for a benefit that we're already getting without spending the money. Let me go ahead and pull up our and sorry if that was a confusing question, but I think I, I think I follow it. I mean, we definitely do have a lot of years of service at the city. We have a lot of people that are above the 10 year mark. We have many that are pushing 20 um, and even higher than 20 years. Um, you know, again, I, I think that the, this, the, the way that our system is structured now, it's an example of a system that wasn't created in an objective way, and it's not entirely based in data. And, and in compensation um, philosophies, generally that competitive pay is at the midpoint of a salary ban. And so if we're gonna maintain competitive pay, um, that should be the starting point that we build that range and we can move up to the max and down to the min. Um, what we're doing right now is essentially kind of shortchanging some people who've been here for a long time who aren't getting paid if they would get paid somewhere else. And I, I, under, I think I understand where you're coming from because there is definitely a cost to this. Um, but I think there's also a cost if, if we don't do something like this in employee morale, um, and, you know, eventually in our ability to handle turnover that will occur because those 20 year employees probably aren't going to be here a whole, whole lot longer. Um, mm -hmm. so I want to make sure that our pay ranges um, really are competitive. And if, if I'm looking around in other agencies, um, I see that people can max out a lot higher. Their earnings potential is, is much higher in other organizations. And um, I'll add while Kylie's um, looking to pull up that um, data and talk maybe a little bit more specifically, um, it's also important that the, this system will um, ensure that we've got some internal equity as well. And that's that's a really important component of, of this proposal is that we, uh, we eliminate some sort of structural inequities that already exist in our pay scale and our pay ranges. The other thing that we're starting to see happening is as people are leaving the organization for whatever reason, and we're recruiting particularly um, hard to fill positions, we're finding that we're having to place people higher in the range than at entry level, because um, they're either in a, another position that's already got mm -hmm. a pretty competitive pay at, you know, at our midpoint or near our high range, or in some cases we're hiring people who are um, already have quite a few years of service and they're not really interested in starting over. And so there's an interesting dynamic that we may have um, people near or at top step who've been here a long time and also people who are near or at top step who haven't been here a long time. And that creates some kind of internal friction as well. It doesn't fully recognize the time and service. And, and I know that this isn't just about time and service, but it is a, it is a, component of how we compensate people. And Mike might be able to talk mm -hmm. about some of the larger um, industry trends in those areas too. Just looking at the years of service um, in the data that we're looking at for this project, which is a, you know, a few months old now, we have um, you know, nearly 50 employees who have over 10 years of service with the city. Um, and a, almost 25 of those are more than 20. So we are going to see a lot of those folks retire in, you know, not too long. 
Other questions for Kylie or Mike or group? Councilor Stephens has her hand raised. Go ahead, Wendy. Thanks. And then for, we could probably take down the slide, which would give us an opportunity to see more on the main, the main plate. There we go. Yep. Awesome. Okay, and this might be a combination of a question for Mike and Kylie. Um, Mike, you had mentioned in your presentation when you were answering the question about um, the increased maximum that you could have along with a, a really uh, good system for evaluating mm -hmm. performance and things like that. Uh, what is, and Kylie, this where, it might be where you come in, what scope of, is outside of the scope of work that would be inherently necessary for us to do in order for this to be successful. You know what I mean? Like we're gonna get a product here that has a certain scope mm -hmm. of work and there will be additional work that will come along with this in order to make sure that we can fully utilize what we've done so far. Yeah, so so we'll have the recommendations come out of this and then like I said at the beginning, we'll as a city go back in and, and look at this through our lens of our budget um, our core services discussion, those types of things, and, and end up sharing our, you know, actual recommendation. We'll also make sure that we've got the right data in there, um, aged appropriately for who has a merit increase or a promotion or something like that, um, or if any turnover has happened since then. Um, I think the conversation about a more standardized or consistent performance management methodology it's something that we've talked about as a management team. We have some departments who are very, very solid at conducting performance evaluations. Uh, many of those department heads are on the call tonight. I see their evals as they come through, but they're not consistent throughout the entire city. Um, and we, we've looked at using some technology to help us with that, um, but we haven't ultimately come up with, with a recommendation on what we'd like to do for it this time. And do you think that that particular, that work would be necessary to be able to fully implement this or could be done later or, and you can implement them separately from each other or are they dependent on, you know what I mean? Because there's a segment. Oh, I think I understand your question. I don't, I don't know if they're exactly dependent on each other. I think, you know, in an ideal world, we would have a very consistent performance management strategy across the city at the same time that we do a compensation adjustment. I don't know if that's something we have the capacity to do as a city right now. Um, this, I'm, I'm confident that we can implement recommendations from this effectively right. and then continually work on bringing consistency to that performance management strategy. Great, that, and that was my question, to make sure that we because we had capacity to be able to do it effectively. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. And, and, and I agree with Wendy, I see exactly, you know, Wendy has quite a little expertise in, in HR in her own company, um, you know, and I just can go back to the, 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 my, my, my experience as a banker where uh, as, a, as a district leader, I looked at uh, probably 150, and we looked at positionings within the grade, we looked at performance, and then we had discussions that were two days with all of us in the room. Mm -hmm. It was hard, but there totally was a consistency across all bands of employment, so we do that they may not be the same criteria, but the way we look at them were completely in sync and you knew you were getting a, a consistent evaluation, and then we linked that to uh, time uh, pay, and really got a sense. And that was a that was a big, you know, every, twice a year. Uh, well, we do that mid year just to look at performance, and at the end of the year, that was a week process for all of us in the whole state that we're doing that, and we would sit and have very lively discussions around those issues. And maybe many of you out there have had that experience, but I can get a sense of where, where Wendy's coming from that perspective. Yeah, I think the, the pay for performance is very different um, in private sector than in the public sector. There are some public sector organizations that use a strategy that incorporates pay for performance. Um, the last place I worked, we did that. 
um, at least for our exempt and management level positions, we would have you know factors like that go into our evaluation and dictate whether or not you got an increase and how big that might be. Um, right now, the recommendations from this are to to use the the grades and steps, but to get to that midpoint, you know, at a reasonable amount of time, and then ease off as you get to the maximum. Um, if, if we want to look as a city at a pay for performance model, that's something that we could definitely do. I don't know if we've got the capacity to evaluate that right now. Um, and, 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 just to, and just to add to that, Kylie, I've come to grips with that a long time ago, um, that there is a differential. But the one thing that I still struggle with a little bit is that we have departments that do a good job of evaluation and others that don't. And I really want to see a consistency there because I, you know, our greatest asset is our employee, but our greatest liability can be if we don't handle them equally across the board. And um, so I do understand that. One last question that I would have is <clears throat> we've been working on this project. It's been on the table and we've been working and I am so excited to be to a point where we are having a consultant's report in front of us. The next question I have is I know there's a lot of additional work to be had, but when we look at the budget, okay, and the impacts that it could have on the budget, how prepared are we you know, and I, we're not looking out three years, but how prepared are we for, and the budgets in, you know, the budget uh, for 2000 and 2001 is already enacted. We're getting close to the six month point, but where are we in our thought process? And Jeff, you can be a part of this too, of 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2024, because it's going to put a bit of a strain on a budget where we have now just come up and made a determination where we'd like to be with our reserves. So that would be a question. So we would definitely, once we're comfortable with the data and we understand what the cost implications of the various implementation strategies are, we need to build those into our forecasting model and see what kind of impact it had um, year over year on the organization before we could come back to you with a firm recommendation. Thank you for that. Other questions from uh, council? And I can't see all of you, so... Uh, Claudia, if you see hands I don't see. Mayor, doesn't look like I see any other hands. Okay. Well, this has been a really good discussion. Um, Mike, any closing comments for us? Uh, Kylie, any closing comments for us? Mike, do you have anything? Um, for me, just a pleasure working with you all. That's about it. I appreciate the questions and the discussion tonight. And just to let you know that we're here for all the follow-up questions. If you have any, uh, Kylie can send them over and Deke Shane, Karen and I will get the, the answer we can get. We'll find it. Thank you, Mike, and for your group. Uh, again, these are the these are the analyses that uh, when you're talking about, about R squared, that's above me, okay? <laughs> And I love numbers, but boy, yeah, that's above me. Uh, Kylie, again, any closing comments from you? And then also just re-address re, re, re where you're going to be going in the time, uh, the time frame that we could expect. Yeah, so um, like Jeff said, we'll put this um, kind of through the lens of our budget model and our forecasting model. So we'll come back to the council with that, I'm not 100% sure of the timeline on that, so I'll need to, to, to connect with Jeff um, and Jennifer on that one. Um, I think one thing I wanted to convey out of this um, to the council is, you know, this is another example of a system that we have at the city, and um, it's really important that we, we build systems objectively and that we maintain them over the long term. So. I look at this recommendation as it's kind of a, a checkup and, and the recommendation is to get us in alignment with the market. Um, and then if we maintain this kind of a system, which one of the really nice things about using that decision ban method is that it's a pretty easy to maintain system. 
I don't think we'll see major adjustments in the future. You know, maybe just little catch ups here and there, small market adjustments, but nothing to the magnitude that we're seeing on this. So this is kind of a point in time and, and we wanna make recommendations to, to make improvements on it. But if we can maintain these kinds of systems, um, you know, we shouldn't have to come back with, with presentations like this, like we'll just take care of it. Um, so hopefully that's the case um, and we don't have to R square you again. <laughs> <laughs> I would like I, to clarify that that's radius squared and if you don't know how to apply it, then you don't know how much wine is in your tank. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from a winemaker, right Remy? <laughs> it's important, it's important. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, I, I'd like to thank um, uh, our consultants. I'd like to uh, thank the employees that are on the line and our department heads and uh, you taking a real interest in our discussions tonight and council. And then we've got some community members that are with us also this evening. So again, thank you for a good discussion, one that we've been waiting to have for a long time and have a, have a good evening, be safe and uh, We'll see you sometime on the same station at a later time. So thank you.